Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to a special Friday, October 16th, 2015 edition of Nature of Reality Radio. This is your host, Andrew Fisher, broadcasting, normally broadcasting Wednesdays from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. Today, of course, a Friday episode. I had to do that because my guest, R. Keith Andrews, could not do Wednesdays, was not available on Wednesdays, had to do a show on another day, and I chose today to do it. However, I hate to say this, but I am a little uh, concerned uh, about him showing up. I got this show URL set up two days ago. He had a link, excuse me, not a link, a a little banner on his website, innervoiceenterprises.com, saying that he would be doing a show with me today. And uh, it said more info coming soon, though, because I didn't send it to him until two days ago. I never got a response from him when I sent him a the link to the show this past Wednesday, and I also tried to contact him directly from the the website, innervoiceenterprises.com, didn't hear from him. Hopefully, he will be tuning in. I always tell my guests that I do news for the first five to ten minutes, so maybe 6 or 5 p.m. Eastern when he calls, but just a quick thing about R. Keith Andrews. He is, as I said, the founder of Innervoice Enterprises, which seeks to help people cope with and succeed in this crazy world filled with troubled relationships, struggling businesses, missing time, and paranormal things like ETs, UFOs, and a hidden past. He has gotten many positive reviews from clients and hopes that recent requests made to him to come on radio programs such as mine will not only help his business, but also bring some sanity and success to this matrix on Earth. I guess it only makes sense for me to let him uh, uh, use this show opportunity as a sales pitch of sorts to see if people would like to interact with him to come up, uh, fix their problems and such, things that they're dealing with in everyday life. I do hope people tune in. If he doesn't tune in on, um, by 6.15, I guess I may have to postpone this show. I mean, but without further ado, I will first start with the news, courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. First article is a red-linked article Hillary Clinton, nationwide gun ban repeal of Second Amendment is, quote, worth considering, unquote. But Hillary also demanded we ship guns to ISIS-linked rebels. Oh, the hypocrisy. Yes, the U.S. government publicly runs ISIS, which for all intents and purposes is the same as al-Qaeda. They started using the name ISIS because people were catching on to the fact that al-Qaeda is controlled by the United States government to a great extent. Well, so is ISIS and uh well, the Egyptian goddess Isis, a uh, very strong symbol in the Illuminati, so it shouldn't come as an astonishment that they would name uh, some Islamic rebel group uh, after an Egyptian goddess that the Illuminati bloodlines think is very symbolic uh, for them. And <clears throat> Hillary Clinton, of course, would want to take our guns to control us, inflict tyranny upon us, and want to repeal the Second Amendment, which would, which was put in there by the Founding Fathers so we could protect ourselves from tyrants in government. And I've always said that I will never forget that scene in David Icke's Revelations of a Mother Goddess documentary where Arizona Wilder, that Illuminati mind-controlled slave who was having her brain like rewired and wired back so she could remember the things so the mind control was failing and she could remember things, remembered how when she was in satanic Illuminati rituals, got the chance to see political and corporate leaders shapeshift and into reptilians and into humans, back into reptilians and such. And she said, I saw Hillary Clinton before I knew she was Hillary Clinton. Creepy. All right, uh, next article. McDonald's on last leg as its all-day breakfast gimmick implodes. A last-ditch effort actually causing stores to lose more money and customers. Yes, we do not want McDonald's in business anymore. McDonald's, all it does is serve crap, and its food is designed to poison us. Their burgers are not actually cow meat, and their fries can cause cancer, and uh, their chicken nuggets have plastic in them. It's disgusting. And now this all-day breakfast gimmick is falling apart. Oh, goody. Let's hope McDonald's falls apart because that's a major globalist corporation to control us and poison us. And so our Burger King and Wendy's to a great extent. Uh, Next article, a middle school assignment. Would you save whites or blacks from a sinking ship? (laughs) Students also asked to choose between Obama, Trump, a Hispanic woman, a rabbi, and a minister. Oh, my God. What kind of assignments are our public schools, our prison? Well, I don't know if this is a public middle school, but even the non-public schools are, in some regards, not much better than the public schools, which are designed to be prison or quasi-prison at best and indoctrinate children and 
and all the rest of it, and this is a disgusting assignment indeed. Uh, next article. Paul Craig Roberts, the CIA may assassinate Putin. CIA has a long history of assassination. Yes, Putin, he may be a globalist Illuminati puppet, just like Barack Obama, but he is getting sick and tired of what he is seeing the U.S. do and all that, and they may not approve of him doing that, and so they may want to assassinate him. Although I guess in, in some regard they don't want to assassinate Putin because they like his uh, like his arrogance. I don't want to take orders from my globalist masters. I can do what I want to a great extent. <laughs> But uh, Putin, I don't know. I, I maybe he. We should treat Putin as a love him, hate him kind of guy because if if the CIA wants to assassinate him because he's exposing U.S. government corruption, then well, as as my uh, previous guest uh, from back in the day, um, uh, what John Nicholson said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> Next article: Obama spent 4.4 million tax uh, dollars on golf and private fundraisers in two months. Documents show an astounding cost to America, uh, Americans of President's jaunts. Yes, Obama, could you please stop spending all of our tax dollars, which we don't even have to pay to you because we don't even owe that money because we never borrowed it in the first place, and it's not illegal to not pay back money you never owed. So uh, this is uh, find a better way to do your job as president and do your president the excuse me do your job as president the right way. The president is supposed to act as the quarterback of the United States government, the quarterback of Congress, so to speak. He's supposed to like call the plays to some degree, say, Congress, this is a good play, this is a bad play, I veto, but I'm going to give you the chance to counter veto because I'm just uh, supposed to act as the play caller in sorts and Congress is supposed to have the final say and the courts are supposed to act as a neutral arbiter to to make sure everybody's happy and all that. So, But Obama is acting like a dictator and that's what the powers that be want, so... Let's let's act like we're pissed off with this four point four million dollar tax dollar thing on golf and private fundraisers. Our right, next article: uh, Villains in New Captain America comic are opponents of illegal immigration. The superhero turns socialist. Uh, okay, um, getting off of Captain America and the comics for a second. Illegal immigration. I've always said my my take on that is I would love to see the day where we could cross international borders without any government permission or paperwork filing and everybody would be cool about it. I'd love to see the day where ships, where people who privately own ships can dock their ships, sail their ships into ports and rivers and waterways on public international ways and waterways and such and not have to go through an Ellis Island type procedure to to have to immigrate into this country, but then again, you have to understand in this matrix that we are still living in, not all borders are created equal. Countries, for example, that border Switzerland would have a be much more comfortable than countries bordering Mexico, or just look at the major difference between the American-Mexican border and the Canadian-American border. There's a lot of big differences there, and well, that says a lot, so it's not that a bad idea to make immigrants from other countries go through a process to immigrate into America. Next article, ammo control picks up steam among Democrats aiming to limit gun access. Why is it that we have background checks for guns, but not background checks for ammunition? It makes no sense. Yes, we're not even supposed to have background checks for guns. The right to bear arms means you're not supposed to have to go through any sort of a background check to own guns, but the complicit and cowardly gun salesmen continue to go along with it. It's not, I mean, I know what my uh, previous guest, Ed Baker, said about how he thinks background checks are common sense, but how can you say that back, giving a, forcing someone to go through a background check to get a gun is common sense when it's supposed to be a right and not a privilege to own guns? Well, I mean, any gun store salesman can say, well, he's supposed to have the right, therefore, to say, I don't want to do a background check on people. I don't have to do a background check on people. And if somebody commits a crime with a gun that I sell to them, I am not responsible for any crimes that they commit. So I can't be sued and I'm not liable. If you sue me, you have no choice but to say, but the courts have, would, no, would have no choice in the end but to say, I am not responsible. I'm not liable. And the lawsuit would have to be dropped. I know people out there who are really cowardly and complicit with the gun uh, gun privilege, so to speak, are going to say that, that it's ridiculous that I would say something like that. But there's a difference between right and privilege, and in America, right to bear arms means – well, bear means concealed carry and open carry. Bear is bear, concealed or open, and 
Um, of course, if you try walking down the street with an open carry gun, all hell's going to break loose because some paranoid resident is going to call the cops on you. It's a shame that we have to – that's the way things go in this matrix. Let's try not to be paranoid, folks. Respect people's right to bear arms. All right, one last article. Sign of things to come. Maine, the state of Maine now allows concealed carry without permit. All residents age 21 or over will no longer need a permit to carry a pistol or revolver on their person when traveling on foot or in their cars. Okay, well, the thing about over age 21, now that's the one problem here. Don't say, don't, don't you dare tell me that people under the age of 18 don't have the same rights as adults. We're all, the only entity that can grant rights is the creator, so therefore people that are infants have just as many rights as people that are 120 years old. Of course, when it comes to the development of someone until they turn 18 years old, parents do have some legal leeway in restricting the rights of people under the age of 18 if doing so is necessary for the proper development of those people. But that does not change the fact that the totality of the circumstances allows uh, – the only time you can have rights violated is if the totality of the circumstances allows for it. Therefore, minors have the same rights as adults. Of course, the public schools don't really act like they understand that. And they even acknowledge, you're a minor, you have no rights. Well, that, that's that's bullshit. You, you're you a child of the creator. You have just as many rights as adults. And any school that punishes you for for exercising your rights is abusing its authority, no questions asked, and doing something it doesn't have authority to do. So, well, state of Maine, good job. But I would appreciate if all residents, regardless of age, will no longer need a permit to carry a pistol or revolve on their person when traveling on foot or in their vehicles. Although I would respect the parent saying that in order for my kid to develop, I cannot let them carry a gun on them. That would, to some degree, make sense. To a great degree, make sense. Okay, I believe, oh, I believe this is our Keith Andrews. Uh, hello, area code 250. Is this our Keith Andrews? It is so. Oh, hi, how you doing? How are you? I was a little con- uh, great. I was a little concerned because I didn't get the link to the show ready until a couple days ago, and you never responded to those messages I gave you, and I was concerned that you might not show because I got no response from you. But, hey, uh, it's a good thing you're here. I can now breathe a sigh of relief. And I do apologize, though, for not getting this info to you sooner because I see on your website it said more info coming soon. And I guess if I was able to give you that a couple day a couple days earlier than Wednesday. You may have been able to set something up there, but believe me, Friday shows. Haven't realizing I had a show on Friday, I didn't realize that until a couple days ago when I was looking at my uh next uh guest schedule and realized, oh I got a guest this Friday. I gotta do something as soon as my show on Wednesday is over. So I did. It's great to see you. And um all right, I'm already two minutes behind schedule in regards to when I said I would get you on. I went two minutes over with the news. So let's get right to this. I already covered everything that I wrote in my bio about you. So let's uh start off with a simple question. You got the floor here. What is Inner Voice Enterprises and what does it do? You got the floor and after you explain everything, well as you're as you're talking, I'll jot down some notes so I can think up some questions for the rest of this interview. You got the floor. What's Inner Voice Enterprises and what does it do? Well, essentially what we are, Intervoice Enterprises literally means we help people. I am a professional psychic. I am um, looking into or working with people to help them reclaim the power over their own lives, reconnect with each other. Uh, Quite literally, if you name the topic, we literally cover it. Um, One of the biggest issues is helping people realize and helping people access their own intuition, their own instincts, and most importantly, help people get back in touch with the concept that everybody on this planet is connected. Now, the, the reason for the name Inner Voice is because everybody talks about listening to that little voice in their head or paying attention to those little hints that has it um, a gut feeling or what some people call female intuition. Everybody is born with it. And what we are doing is helping people, guiding people to reconnect with that, to reaccess it so that they can actually live a more productive life. And I'm, I'm referring to more productive as in more prosperous, more cooperative, essentially trying to show people or reminding people how to get back to the concept that everybody on the planet, doesn't matter what race, doesn't matter what, um, doesn't matter what nationality or what skin color, 
everybody is essentially the same. Now, when I started Inner Voice, we opened, we opened Inner Voice Enterprises August 15th of 2007. And what the, what the concept at that point was, was to help people through using higher senses, what a lot of people call psychic senses or intuition, to really get in touch with where their life was going and how to reclaim control over it, how to reaccess memories, how to implement this sort of thing in a more productive fashion. What we discovered was that there was a staggering amount of misinformation out there. And more and more, especially recently, more and more people were starting to look to the, look to the heavens, look to um, the UFO phenomenon, look to the other races, look for an explanation as to what or who God really is and what he was intending. All of these things are part of what we do. The culmination of that at this point is we are actually having a, the, our first annual peace conference, peace standing for preparing earth alien cultural exchange, meaning we're taking the whole concept of people going, you're black, therefore you're a different race, or you're white, therefore you've got less rights than this, than this other group. And we're going, look, you're all the same. You're all like black, white, yellow, doesn't matter. Not only are you all the same race, but you all have innate instincts. You're born with these what people call psychic senses or the paranormal, beyond normal. The reality is children that are born, and it doesn't matter what race you come from, what nationality, Every child is born with psychic capacity. And through Inner Voice, we teach people not only how to, how to access that or how to understand their dreams, we also teach people how to heal, okay, where doctors have given up on them and said, look, we can't do it. With, through Inner Voice, we teach people how to remind their own bodies how to heal. Now... One of the one of the biggest things that we that we take a look at is in order for this to work, in order for people to be able to reclaim their 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 power, their ability, what people have to remember is that they have to believe it's possible. Now, that's one of the biggest things that people I hear, and it doesn't matter what walk, I hear people talking about what can't happen is impossible well the sad reality of it from that standpoint is that the that when you're looking at what people are capable of doing if you look at what's not possible they said quite literally that it was not possible to cross the atlantic well apparently we did They've said it's impossible for people to get along. Well, the fact that we have now got cities with millions of people in them prove that that's possible. So it, it really is, with Inner Voice, it's a case of reminding people how to turn around and how to, well, simply put, make the impossible possible. And, you know, we, we, we strive to show people that... Just because you don't understand something doesn't mean that it can't work or that it won't work. One, of the, one, one thing that I keep telling people, um, way back, way back in the 70s, I, and I was only a child in the 70s, I told people then that, um, I told the doctors then, that they would never understand the healing rate of the human genome until such time as they started looking at the triple helix. What, they, what I didn't realize, because they told me I was nuts, what I didn't realize was that they didn't have the technology at that point to see the triple helix. Okay, 
about roughly speaking about seven years ago, maybe eight years back now, the major research centers finally found the triple helix. And now they're starting to look at that. That's where the, where the biggest issue is, um, where, where the biggest complication is, is quite often what, what I see through, through Intervoice, through my connections there, is that a lot of the information that I know is possible, modern medicine or modern science has not been able to prove it yet. And they turn around and do it about 30 years later. Now, the, the nice part about it with what I'm dealing with is there are so many questions that are out there that what, that what I find people asking is questions that they're afraid to ask other people. Okay, you can't go to a shrink, for instance, you know, can't go to a psychiatrist and go, oh, I think I saw a UFO. Because what I found, even in that particular group, the, even in the people, amongst people that say, oh, we believe in, in UFOs, even amongst those people, you tell them, I saw one, and three quarters of them will look at you as though you got four eyes. Okay. You take a look at the gay community, and even amongst the gay community itself, they argue with who's gay and who's not. The religious communities argue between each other. We're all talking about peace, and yet 80% of the wars are caused by religious differences. So what, we are, what we're trying to do is a very big job, a very cross cut of, of society, if you will. And you name the topic, I've probably ended up dealing with it. You know, in, in simplest terms, I've been doing this work for just over 40 years now. And we did a calculation a little while ago and figured I dealt directly with something in the neighborhood of about 50,000 individual clients. About 80% of my clients are either repeat or referral. So when, of course, now I'm starting to branch out and get into some of the other tangled masses that are out there. Um, we just got back from a conference, the Experiencer Speak conference out in Portland, Maine, which is a group of people that have been abducted or feel they've been abducted by off-worlders, by ancient races, um, you know, in all fairness, it, it's such a wide variety of, of different areas that, that I deal with. And on such an individual level, it's a little hard to pin down one aspect. You know, if you, if you think of it, like when you're looking at the restaurant industry, everybody wants to know, they go to a restaurant to eat, a particular type of food that that restaurant has. The questions I get you know, that I end up dealing with is I deal directly with questions from literally everything from cold case files to where businesses are going to go or how to turn them around or how to make finances stretch a little further. Right. So these are, these are all different aspects of the same thing. Now, like I, I'm looking, I always watch when I'm on a show, I always watch the chat room and do my best to answer any questions that pop up in there as well. The one thing I do want to make clear though, for those of you that are in the chat room, for pity's sakes, if you have a question, put it in in bold, uh, like in, in capital letters, so that I can spot it. Because sometimes chat rooms have a tendency of getting a little carried away. You know, um, I, I wasn't entirely certain exactly what, um, what, what you wanted or what we were looking at discussing today. So I'm sort of running it on, the, on a cuff. The nature of reality is, is the, I like the name of the show because it really does modify or does account for the way people look at life. Now, one of the one thing you got to look at when we talk about something called reality reality in a nutshell is an agreement 
Now, let's try for the, the simple side of it. Most people think that, for instance, a dining room table is solid. But we know from basic, from basic physics that that is not the case. It is simply molecules are moving slower, so it appears solid. Okay, the neat part with reality is it is mutable, it is changeable. Same as wherever somebody is standing in their life, that can be changed and the miscalculation people make is going, where do I want my life to go? Well, you don't actually have to have that answer. We are misguided when we are told as kids you have to have your life in order. You've got to know where you're going by the time you're, you know, by the time you get out of high school into your early 20s, if you're going to be successful. Well, the sad reality is that most people don't know where they're going until they get into their 50s. That is the, the biggest complication that, that people run into right off the bat. Now, on top of one of the one of the other things we're working on, we've got the individuals we work with. We are currently looking for different um, radio engagements, different television engagements, you know, speaking at, at live conferences on a variety of subjects. We are also we've got the peace conference coming up. We are in the process, we've already put out the, the first edition of what will eventually become a global magazine, which is going to focus on, well, it does focus on literally the positive side of what is happening. Now, I heard it mentioned this issue about guns and about gun control and all that. Well, here's something to consider. And this is really important, especially for the people listening that are part of the law enforcement and part of the governing bodies that decide what needs to be made a law. I have yet to see, or even for that matter, hear about a gun getting up and shooting somebody. Now, when you start talking about gun control, you got to remember the only people that are going to actually register guns, if they're going to at all, are the ones that are law abiding. The people that are going to break the law aren't going to tell you they got a gun anyway. So all that's going to do is simply provide the, if you will, criminals with an upper hand. Now, this is where the, the legal system has been turned upside down. Because if you think back to when the legal system was originally built, it was built by criminals to protect criminals. It was built to get the guilty people off. Now, there's a fundamental problem with that. So when you start looking at that, let's go right back to the beginning and look at what the ultimate basis of what I do is. Go with the flow. There's a, there's a term that basically accounts for, for most people where a lot of them are referred to as sheeple, meaning somebody does something and everybody else follows. Point in fact, down at a park one day, I simply stopped in the middle of the park. There were a lot of people around, and I started looking at the sky. Now, there was nothing up there. Okay, I wasn't looking for anything particular. I just started looking up. And it didn't take very long. And this is something you people, the, you listeners, can, can actually do just to try it for yourself. But I started looking at the sky. And in no time, all of a sudden, other people were looking at the sky. And pretty quick, everybody, you know, there were people pointing, and then more people were pointing at the sky. And I finally got asked by somebody what I was looking for. And I looked at him, and I said, well, in all fairness, I was looking to see how long it was going to take for people to start looking at the sky. And I says, basically, it took me less than five minutes. Now, the, the whole point of that was to find out how fast people could go down an interesting path. One of the reasons people don't speak up is because of self-esteem issues. They don't feel that, they, that their opinion matters or they feel they'll be ignored or they'll be chastised or made fun of. 
four words that are imperative for everybody. Now, something you got to remember about this, the four words, and these are for everybody to look at. I am worth it. Now, I believe in these four words so strongly, I actually had them laminated and put on my own fridge. Now, the funny thing about the fridge, when it comes to helping yourself and helping your friends, it doesn't matter what's written on the fridge, even if it's all, all, even if it is only an emblem. People will read whatever's on it. Those four words can make the world a difference to people. So what we're looking at is how to help people realize that, how to get people to understand what they're going on, you know, what they're going through, and how to really take control of, of that aspect of their life. The, the difficult part, of course, is where, where do you go with it? Now, I hear a lot of people complaining about things that are going wrong or things that mean need to be done differently. And the ironic part of it is that most people don't actually, if you will, get up and do anything with it. They sit there, they'll complain, but the greater majority don't actually move. Now that's where it becomes a problem. And this is why I said you don't actually have to know where you're going. What has to happen is you have to know where you are. Now, take, for example, if you're sitting on a couch and you're not comfortable, nobody turns around and thinks, gee, I wonder if I'd be more comfortable in a different chair or, gosh, I wonder if I could... You know, if I stand up or if I move a little on the chair, if I'll be more comfortable. All that happens is they move or they adjust themse- themselves, they modify where they're sitting. If they're still uncomfortable, they move again. The same thing applies to your life. If you're not happy with an aspect of it, make a change. You don't have to know what you're changing it to. You simply have to know what you're changing it from. Okay, now I'm I'm hoping that this is making making sense to people. Um, frankly, from my standpoint, it's a pretty black and white problem. People have to start taking responsibility for their own issues. Okay, they really have to turn around and give themselves permission to move forward. Okay. Now, here's, here's the fun part of, of doing live radio. Usually, I hear something going on, and right now, I'm hoping we're still on the air. <laughs> but um, Yeah, but we're still here. I'm just, I'm just on mute. I'm just on mute. Oh, okay. Um, one, of the, one of the neat little par situations that, that we work with is showing people how to take control of quite frankly, any aspect of their life that seems to be out of balance. One of the first things that that I have found, let's cover the first, the, the three basic karmic laws. And this is what everything revolves around. Because these three laws, when you look through the different religions, will actually cover the commandments and the guidelines in those religions, in, in virtually every religion I've seen. Now, The three karmic laws are, number one, you must be true to you first. Now, what that means is when you're looking at doing something, children, when they're born, know right from wrong. They know what's good. They know what's bad. So it really is an issue for them of making absolutely certain that If you're going to do something, once you are old enough to have the cognitive capacity to say, oops, it is imperative that you do what feels right. Now, that is not the only guideline. Karmic law number two says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that is taught in every one of the religions I've looked at. The ironic part of it is people don't do that. Now, what it means by, by 
do unto others what you would have them do unto you is when you're doing something, when you're interacting with people, make sure that you are interacting, that what you're doing or what you're saying to them is what you desire them to treat you like. Now, that becomes a very critical issue when you couple it with the first one. So if you're trying to be true to yourself and you want a chocolate bar, but you don't have any money. So you go, well, he said, be true to myself. And I want to take care of me. I want a chocolate bar. So I know I don't have any money, so I'm just going to take it. Before you do that, remember, I said, be true to yourself first. So when you go to look at that possibility of taking a chocolate bar, ask yourself this. If you had a chocolate, if if you own the chocolate bar and somebody else came in and took your chocolate bar because they wanted it, but they didn't have any money, would you be happy with that person? If the answer is honestly, no, I wouldn't, then you're going to run into a couple of interesting issues. But if you honestly wouldn't mind if somebody stole from you, then you certainly don't have any karmic, any, there, there isn't a guideline that will stop you from doing it. But if you look at it and go, but I don't like people stealing from me, then the trick is don't steal from them. If you don't like people walking, you know, going into your private stuff, then stay out of theirs. The third, the third karmic law is energy out, energy in. So this is where the three of them come together. Because when you look at it and you go, I want to take care of me first. Even if you don't understand the idea of, well, taking, taking something from somebody else is wrong. What you got to remember with energy out, energy in, is if you start stealing from somebody else, they will steal from you. That is the energy you're bringing back unto yourself. And this applies across the board. Virtually every religion I've looked at says the same thing. People, when they listen to politicians, a politician stands up and says, I'm going to do this, and then doesn't follow through with it. Okay, and then people go, well, he lied to us when he was on the stand, you know, when he was, when he was in campaign. Well, that is quite probably true. He probably did. The other aspect of that, though, is you elected him or her. And if he, when people figure out that the way to change that aspect is by, by turning around and doing what is right. In other words, if you've got a bunch of politicians and you find out they're lying, you got one of two choices. Either people have to stop electing them, or if you figure you can do it and do a good job, you know, do a better job, then take it under your, under your own hands and using the laws that are in place, set out to do it. Now, a primary example right now, especially for the listeners in the United States, is frankly a gentleman that I met by the name of Ed Baker. Now, he happens to be a presidential candidate down there, but he's independent. He got looking at the situation society was in and went, you know, I don't like it. I don't feel these other candidates that are running are going to do the job that they say they will. And instead of complaining and just sitting back and putting my feet up and yelling at the TV or complaining to my friends about the politicians, I'm going to go out and I'm going to run myself and do my level best to get into office so I can make the changes that I feel are necessary. Where it came to Inner Voice Enterprises, I was sitting there, I'm a working psychic. Now, there's a lot of negative connotations that go hand in hand with that. And truth be told, every psychic is what we, everybody is what is actually more accurately referred to as sensitive, meaning we pick up on extra energies that most people ignore or are trained to look, or they're afraid of them. Well, I looked at it and went, 
I don't desire to do this just as entertainment. I don't desire to make it funny, and some of it can be, but the idea here is to help people. So I spent quite literally years helping people get used to the idea and working with the city, with City Hall here in Kelowna, BC, which is where I'm situated in Canada. And I got City Hall to actually license me as a professional psychic. Now, this was because I didn't like the way the industry was running. I didn't want to be just another person out there giving people and I giving people a direction and going, well, if they take it, great. And if they don't, it's no skin off my nose because I've listed it as entertainment. The reality is I look at it as quite literally a very serious thing, much along the same lines as a psychologist does, as a psychiatrist does. And rest assured, I'm referring to the majority of these people. There are always people in every industry that look at it as a power trip or a way to make good money. That's just not the way I operate. For me, if it were a case of it just being about the money, frankly, I'd probably be a millionaire. Lord knows I've helped make a few. The, the reality of it is that what we do is we show people how to understand what they're going through, how to turn around and take their dreams, take their hopes, and make them a reality. Now, the difficult part there is most people are taught that you cannot do that, that that is not a feasible possibility. So we turn around and, you know, people turn around and they go, well, it's not possible to make that happen. So I'm just going to say it can't be done. Well, you know, if you think about it, in 1960, 1960, it was said that walking on the moon was science fiction. In 1969, it was proven that it was science fact. The same thing applies to everything else. It is only science fiction or imagination until somebody takes the time to turn around and make it a reality. Now, I'm, I'm looking at, my, like, I'm, I'm watching the, the chat room, and right now we've, we've got four people sitting in it, so I'm presuming this is, is normal for this show. Um, some shows have real active chat rooms, and that's just where, where it is. Some don't. What I don't know is if this is normal for this chat room because – Well, frankly, I'm having internet fun trying to keep things running, so I'm not entirely certain if if it's actually doing what it's supposed to. No, no, it, it, it's normal. This show when it doesn't really air at a time that's convenient for people to, to listen live because everybody's either going home from work or eating dinner with everybody. The vast majority of my listeners are in the archive listeners category. I always make sure to upload my shows to YouTube, though, and that's where the <clears throat> majority of the, the views come in. So um, this, is, uh, this is normal. Uh, nothing to feel ashamed of for me or you or anybody else. But um, it, even though there aren't any questions there, at the moment, uh, Sean Cohen, if she has a question, I'm sure she'll uh, she'll chime in. She's my most faithful fan. Um, but I do have some questions that I was able to jot down, some notes that jotted down as you were talking. And um, I, I guess I'll start off right uh, with one of the most hard and most difficult things to discuss. Um, is there a hope for humanity? Now, a couple of different points of view on this. Uh, let me give two prominent figures in, in the truth movement and their opposing viewpoints on this issue. When I interviewed uh, George Kavosilis back in the day, he had once said that there is it is impossible for the New World Order to take over the Earth and fulfill their agenda of global totalitarian government because on planet Earth, infinite love will always prevail. And I asked George, how do you know that? He told me, I have felt in my heart's adolescence that Mother Earth is a love-based entity, so even if the New World Order were to try to fulfill its evil agenda, they will never be able to succeed because you can't do that on an infinite love planet. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have someone like Jordan Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell has repeatedly said he does not believe there is any 
uh, hope for humanity. He says that the people of planet Earth are too complicit, too cowardly, too paradigmatic, too fearful, and too stupid. They will refuse to believe something shocking or disturbing, even if the evidence shows they have no choice but to believe it. He even said uh, 9-11 was what did it in for him, because to see that giant twin skyscrapers over 1,000 feet tall could get pulverized into microscopic dust, and nobody except a small handful of conspiracy theorists ask questions and express doubts about it was enough for him to all but give up on the human race. Now, if you were to tell Jordan Maxwell uh, about George Kavaslis' claim that Mother Earth being an infinite love planet um, means that the powers that be will never be able to succeed, Jordan Maxwell would probably say something like, well, I didn't say that humanity is totally, entirely doomed. I have said that if there is some sort of divine intervention, then humanity will definitely have some sort of a chance to to succeed. And he has said on previous shows that I think the ultimate key to beating the powers that be, aside from expanding consciousness, would be to ask our guardian angels and spirit guides for help. Now, this whole question about there being a hope for humanity or whether the human race is just too flat-out stupid and we're doomed, and the human race, like Jordan Maxwell says, can be thought of as the animals that on the African savanna that are grazing by the river and they're just minding their own business, and then all of a sudden just like one or two predators jumps out of the uh, bushes, then you see like the hundreds and hundreds of animals that were grazing running away in terror. They outnumber the predators by a ratio greater than 100 to 1, but they're all cowards. He says that's the way he sees the human race. That's why we're screwed. Well, no, we're not screwed because Mother Earth is an infinite love planet. So says people like George Kavazilis. <laughs> so um, so this idea of there being hope for humanity and people that believe there isn't, the pessimists, uh, what do you have to say to, to them? Well, <laughs> in in a nutshell, is there hope for humanity? Well, the short answer is yes. What people have to realize is there's an old saying that goes, hope springs eternal. Well, the problem with hoping for humanity is that it does just that. Okay. Um, where it comes down is this. I sort of, I'm sort of in a, at a halfway point between the two. Now, do I and did I go through a very long period of time looking at the human race and going, you know, you're stupid? Absolutely, I did. My, my ex-wife actually made the comment that I was the only true racist she'd ever met. And I looked at her and I went, you want to run that by me again? And she goes, look, everybody else goes, you know, virtually everybody else goes, you're black, therefore you're bad. Or you're white, you're bad. You're a Republican, you're bad. I don't like East Indians. I don't like gay people. She says, you look at the entire human race and go, you're all completely retarded. Now, that's overstated. And I have come to understand something much more important. And that is, it's not that humans are stupid. It is not that humans are inherently nasty, selfish little people. It is a natural evolutionary problem that mankind is going, in, going through. Mankind is an infant race. Now, the issue of the idea of the predator, of the couple of predators coming and chasing down you know, everybody else, you know, 100 to 1 odds, and everybody else runs away because they're cowards, is very normal. This is why I use the term sheeple. The thing people have to realize is this. Is there hope for humanity? The answer is absolutely yes. That's actually why I came back to this planet in the first place. I've got memories that date back literally millions of years. Okay, in all fairness, billions. Most importantly, where it comes to lifetime memories, I've got memories of, of, of civilizations rising and falling. Now, when you talk about hope, hope and faith, prayer, religion, all go hand in hand. The thing people forget is that hope is there and there is a shot for humanity if humanity realizes that hope is not God will take care of it, it'll happen if it's supposed to, it's not my problem, okay, I don't want to be, I don't want to intrude because it's not my business. People have to realize that 
in order to have a world survive, in order for this civilization to prosper, take any city, and we'll just use a, sim- we'll just use a simple city with 100,000 people. Okay. With, with that 100,000 people, we have a neat problem. There might be 300 people running the city, as in City Hall, um, turning around, operating the odds and ends. Okay, operating all the different the different um, sub things, as far as licensing and what have you goes. There's 300 people. There's 100,000 people living in the city. Now, we have been trained. People have been taught to ignore their neighbor, to fear their neighbor. Well, the reality is if 100,000 people start working together and walk into City Hall and say, we want this, City Hall will comply. So when you ask about is there hope, the answer is yes. There's a lot of people with good ideas. But one of the big things I came back here for is to quite literally show people and help people work together. Now, I mentioned that hope comes from religion. It comes from faith. There's a lot of people claiming to be the return of Jesus Christ, for instance. Yet these people are standing there with guns in armed compounds in the middle of nowhere, making it almost impossible to get to them to talk to them. Now, with that in mind, there's a, there's a neat little problem that that doesn't do a thing. Okay, it does not help put people in, in a good place at all. The churches that are around the place that everybody turns to for hope are, in fight, are fighting with each other instead of working to do what they say they're working to do, which is help the common populace. Take a look around your own city. How many churches do you have? And how many of those churches are actually helping the poor people? Okay, and it doesn't matter what religion you look at. They're all doing the same thing. So I'm not picking on anyone in particular. People have to realize it's not a question of there is no hope. It's a question of there has been little to no leadership. Now, why, this is why we've decided to put the universal portal of peace, the universal portal of peace, which is one of my one of our websites, universalportalofpeace.com. We have decided to put on this peace conference to help people understand all of these misunderstandings can be worked through. Now, people say that say it's impossible. Well, they clearly don't realize that prior to the rise of the, of the Western civilization, the Chinese had a number of civilizations that, that grew. All of Europe and a lot of Asia was under one, one person's, if you will, guidance. We go back into a time called when Lemuria existed, which, by the way, were humans. They had managed world peace. So can it be done? The answer is absolutely. This idea that um, the, this new world order can't work. Well, you know, it was said at one point that people, that man would never fly. It was said the telephone would never exist. It couldn't be done. Well, that was a mistake because clearly it can be. So with that in mind, what we've come to, to do with, you know, with, the, with the whole idea of hope for humanity is we are now reaching out and we are looking for the people that still believe it's possible. And I don't mean the people that go, oh, this is a wonderful world and we can all be happy and we can all live together in harmony. Oh, okay. I'm referring to the people that are willing to stand up, put their name on the line and go, I'm here to make a difference in a positive way. You want to change the negative side of the world. Number one, get to know your neighbor. Do not make the mistake of thinking that just because they're a different skin color 
or they come from a different social background or don't have as much money as you, that they're any better or any worse than you are. Okay. Hope itself, if you're going to turn to, to religion to find people that are having similar issues and are trying to find a way of hope, a way of holding on to some sort of glimmer of a better life, then for pity's sakes, draw yourself either to a church that does accept everybody, and that includes blacks, whites, Chinese, North American Indians, gay people, homosexuals, bi's. It doesn't matter. If the church does not accept everybody, then they're not doing, they're not handing the message out properly. It's that simple. Okay, and you'll notice I haven't said one religion is better than the next. The reason being, they aren't. The, the truth is where it comes to hope for a better world, people have to realize not all people live, learn the same way. Not all people think quite the same way. But in order for society to flourish, people do have to respect each other. Now, this idea that the world can only be um, unified under war. Well, let's get real. Okay. Guns, superior firepower has never brought lasting peace. Yes, it brings peace for a while because people are too afraid to do anything. But sooner or later, when all freedoms are taken away, when all um, when there is such an imbalance in power, in wealth, in acceptability, sooner or later society will fight back. Now the question is, can a new world, can a world where peace reigns predominant exist? The answer is definitively yes. But people are going to have to realize this is not going to be done by simply turning the other cheek it is not going to be done by shooting your neighbor or stabbing your neighbor if he doesn't agree with you. It is not going to be done by making laws that put everybody in prison, nor is it going to be done by releasing everybody from prison. The reality is it is a balance. When, now, if we go back 50 years, it was permissible to spank your child if they did something wrong. Now they call it child abuse. Well, how'd that work out? We see society itself has taken a nosedive where it comes to respect, where it comes to treating each other properly. So we have to get back to the idea that just because somebody's emotions get hurt, now do not get me wrong. When we talk about being able to spank, being able to utilize corporal punishment as a last resort, okay, the answer is it's imperative. And the reason for it is some people just flat out will not change unless it becomes more uncomfortable to stay the same the way they are. Now, not everybody is going to survive in this fashion. But like I said, where it comes to the guns, making it illegal to own a gun is, well, frankly, counterproductive because the only people that are going to tell you they own one are the ones that are following the law anyway. Secondly, where it comes to guns, where it comes to blades, where it comes to bombs, the reality is if they are not picked up, if they are not implemented by a person, they don't do anything. Same applies where it comes to hope. If you're talking about a better world, it is not going to be better by sitting on the couch, staring at the idiot box, watching which, which sports team beat what sports team. It is not going to be done from the couch when you isolate yourself and, frankly, either drown yourself in, in beer or alcohol by following a very simple rule. 
everything in moderation. When you see something that is done ineffectively, you have to reach out and say, this is a problem. Now, the hardest thing in the world to do is look in the mirror and tell yourself, I don't like what I see about that person I'm looking at, and then find a way to change it. Now, am I perfect? Absolutely not. Do I have an idea of how to deal with things? The answer is definitively yes. The hard part is when, when you start looking, because people don't like change on the whole, this is obvious, okay? When you start looking in the mirror and you go, this is what, I'm, what I like about me, or this is what I like about the next door neighbor, I'm curious how many people out there actually look at their neighbor and notice anything nice about them, never mind figure out what their name is. People live in fear because they don't know who's around them. They don't know what's coming because they're not involved. Now, we talk about, you were asking about this idea of is the new world order possible? Well, certainly it is. The problem, or the solution, if you will, is to realize a new world order is not a thing that is done by conquest. It is not done by packing up your military from your home, you know, from the home country, and going out and invading another country. It is not done by somebody going, I don't like the way my country is, so I'm going to leave my country, immigrate into another country, and then impose my views from my country that I don't like into this new country that I'm moving to because I didn't like the one I left. If you're leaving your country for whatever reason, leave the country and merge with the new country you've chosen to go to. Do not make the mistake of assuming that because you didn't like your country the way it was, transplanting those ideals into another community is a good idea. It's not going to work well. It will create the same reason you left the last country, given that you're successful in implementing your views that you left the country for, okay, it's going to create a problem. The hope comes from going, I don't like the way my country is, and since I can't change it, I'm going to go to this country that seems to have a better idea. And I'm going to merge with that country's ideals. Now, when two countries side by side share similar ideals, the borders come down. Now, people said that, for instance, North and South Vietnam would never get along. Well, guess what? They're in the middle of peace talks. So much for never. People said that the United States could never come into existence. Well, it did. There are problems. There are things that happen. Not everybody's happy. But hope comes from seeing a dream doing the work, accepting the fact there will be setbacks, coming to realize that those setbacks are much like what I believe it was Alexander Graham Bell that, that it was asked of. He was asked when it came to making the telephone, how do you feel about the 400 failures you made that you had before you got the phone? And his response was, I didn't fail. And the reporter goes, well, you have 400 experiments that didn't work. He goes, yes, you are right, I did. What I succeeded at, though, was I found I successfully proved these 400 methods wouldn't work. And by finding out which ones wouldn't work, he found out the one that would. Net result, the impossible, the ability to talk to people on the other side of the planet the ability to see the other side of the planet has become a reality. The drawback is that technology has risen at such a rate that controlling people by putting stupidity on the, on the TV and having people watch it. Now, I use the term the idiot box because in 1956, when the, when the TV first came out into public access, 
it was coined the idiot box because so many people sat there and stared at it. They forgot how to do things. Hope for a new world is based on you going out your front door, meeting the people that are beside you and getting to know them. Getting to understand the way they are, getting to understand, getting to accept them. You'd be amazed how many people in your neighborhood put their pants on one leg at a time. You'd be amazed how many, when they cut their hand, they will curse or they may scream or they may cry or they may look at it really odd. But they all have similar reactions. You'd be amazed how many people in your neighborhood, regardless of their color, their religious belief, their sexual orientation, you'd be absolutely astounded how many of those people, when they're tired, fall asleep. This is what hope is built on. It is built on understanding, on accepting, and on relishing the similarities and the dissimilarities while respecting all of it. What the New World Order that people are talking about are doing is they seem to be trying to get peace by eliminating freedom. Well, you know, the Roman Empire did that. That didn't work out all that well. The Egyptians did that. That didn't work out all that well. The other thing that you've got to remember where it comes to this issue of is there hope? Well, here's a neat little one that Philadelphia in the United States, figured out 30 years ago. If you take plants, you know those green things hanging around outside your building, and in many cases inside, they proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that positive interaction, that happy music, that laughter and dancing and singing makes plants flourish. And yet negative energy makes them die, arguments, screaming matches, temper tantrums. No matter how you fertilize them, they will die. Earth is a plant. And what is happening with 7 billion people on the planet telling each other, I want to kill you, you're killing the planet you're on, and that is why you have such neat little problems like earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, you know, this sort of thing. Even meteoric impacts, those are always fun. Understand if people would quit looking at everybody else and going, I don't know you, so I'm going to fear you, and therefore I'm going to kill you, or at least try. When people start looking at them and go, okay, if I were a slightly different person, I may be in the same boat that you're in, so I'm going to help you. Now, yes, there are those that will turn around and take advantage of it. So when you find out that that's the way somebody is, quit helping them. Go back to karmic law. Energy out, energy in. Okay? Do unto others as you desire them to do unto you. And be true to yourself. The reality is, is there hope for man? Yes. Man has a couple of qualities that are phenomenal. And the off-worlders, the non-human races, have discovered this. What they discovered is humans have a staggering capacity for curiosity, an incredible ability to make absolutely bizarre conclusions, take a totally logical situation, do something completely off kilter, and still succeed. These people, this is, these are a couple of the qualities that humans across the globe have. Now, so when I talk about is mankind doomed, no. But there are things that mankind is doing that, quite frankly, I agree with the one chap, are absolutely stupid. For instance, scientists know that there is an island in the Canaries, and I'd love to give you the name, but sad to say, that's not my forte. There is an island in the Canaries that has already split it has already dropped four feet. And the, the scientists know it's a volcanic island, it is going to break off, and they know it is going to co- create a tsunami that is going to stretch at least halfway down the Argentine and East Coast, all the way up to the St. Lawrence Seaway. 
they know it's going to go at least 12 miles inland. And yet they are not doing what needs to be done. They know, any scientist I'm sure has to know, and if they don't, hopefully they're listening, they have to split that island off. They've got to break it so that when that island starts to come apart, the chunks of land come apart in pieces so they don't come apart all at once. The island's going to come apart anyway, but if you break the island up, it will not be as big a tsunami. Now, the neat part or the unfortunate part is the secondary and tertiary, the third, second and third tidal waves, one will go down the coast of the west coast of Africa, taking out North Africa, skipping the middle of it because of the way the land lies, and take out South Africa. The other one will go north up the, up the English Channel, flooding England, Scotland, good chunk of Wales and Ireland, not to mention Spain, etc. Now, this is something mankind can stop, but mankind is too busy fighting with itself over whose God is better. There's an old saying that goes, God helps those that help themselves. Well, you know, the reality is people aren't helping themselves on the whole. Most of that is because people don't know where to start. This is why I come back to this issue of I came here to tell people, get your heads out of the sand. The way to make this work, and peace can be global, when people start working together. War used to work as an economic boost because war itself, what happened with it was basically it put a whole pile of people to work because everybody was hand-making weapons or they were hand-making ammo. What it didn't do, you know, and of course that put people to work, whether they were going over to shoot people or whether they were going to stay home, right? The sad part is the reason people were going to kill other people was because somebody else sitting in an office said, I don't like that person. Go and you, you over there, go and shoot him. Or go back to the time when it was like, here's a sword, go and kill him. Now, the difference between the Middle Ages, where it come to that method, and the modern time was in the Middle Ages, more often than not, the people making the decisions were right at the front of the battle. In today's world, the presidents, the prime ministers that are making these decisions that affect the common populace are hiding in multi-million dollar mansions and telling the poor people to buckle up. Well, if you don't start, and I'm referring to the people that have the money, that have the influence, if you don't start treating the people that are less fortunate as equals, they are going to rebel, and the new, this so-called New World Order is not going to work. Peace, hope, for mankind, focuses on whether or not people are willing to work together. Well, there's no, Does that there's make no sense? question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, I just want to see if this person who's in the queue is either just listening or would like to uh, speak to you. Sure. Area code 239, you are on the air. What's your name, where you're from, what's your question? <laughs> I don't have any questions. I'm just listening. So oh, I'm from okay. Florida, Southwest Florida. All right. Thank you for making that clear. Take care now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I think that island you're talking about, uh, that might be Cumbre Vieja. And uh, since you mentioned that, I, I just want to bring up that some people, you say humanity's got to do something to, to, to keep it from happening. Well, it has been said from people in the ET contact E field that there are ETs protecting us from like the dangers, like Fukushima would be a global extinction event if there weren't ETs uh, keeping the radiation in check. It has also been said that the Yellowstone supervolcano is uh, overdue, but the reason it's not going to blow is because there's ETs keeping it from blowing, and they could very well be doing the same thing, keeping this, um, if it is Cumbre Vieja or whatever uh, thing in the Canary Islands you were talking about, 
um, it right. will not collapse. Now, a lot that people would say, well, you shouldn't think like that because you're thinking ETs will come and save me, and that'll that could cause a lot of people to take up a couch potato attitude towards life, which is extremely extremely unhealthy, and I'm sure you could attest to that. So, for all those people out there who say I don't have to do shit because the ETs will come and save me, do you have a response to those people? Absolutely, they're completely off their nut. Um, how is that for subtle? Um, I deal myself with in excess of 25 off-world and ancient races. The difference being off-worlders are what most people call ETs. Off-worlders are the races that didn't grow up on this planet. Okay. The ancient races are the ones that evolved here. Now, do you know, first of all, are the off-worlders, are the ETs helping to contain the the radiation flood the answer is absolutely yes because the radiation flood although it was mankind's stupidity that led to it is something that really the greater majority of people had no way of controlling okay where it comes to yellowstone no they are not actually the ets are not stopping that from going they will not stop the island from breaking because if they were going to stop the island from breaking, it wouldn't have fallen the first four feet. Okay. What they are doing, and this is where a lot of the abductions are taking place for the ETs, the way they were trying that they are trying to help the people of this planet operate. They started by approaching the various governments and by approaching the various governments, they went and said, okay, here's some of the things that you guys need to do. Okay. Um, you know, these are, are some of the things that you can do to stop the world from falling apart. Well, the governments turned around and broke virtually every contract that was made. Now, it's a well understood fact, especially amongst the, the UFO people, that Germany was in touch with UFOs, with extraterrestrials, back in World War II. This is, in fact, true. What they aren't telling you is that they were also in touch with all the governments from all the rest of the major powers. Now, when it comes to the ETs, why don't they just cure the problem and, and heal the illnesses? Well, here's why. You have people out there. Now, ETs, and I, I am the recipient, quite frankly, of an off-world operation that did repair part of me. But the problem with curing the illnesses, the off-worlders helped mankind discover the cure for cancer. Now, you notice it hasn't been released. Well, the reason it wasn't released is because, quite frankly, the corporation that ended up with it, and do not ask me which one has it because I really don't know that one, but the cure for cancer exists. Now, some people say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory that the government, that the corporations are hiding it. Well, you can say what you will. The fact of the matter is, though, that where it comes to the cure for cancer, frankly, if it were released to the public, people would get healthy and billions of dollars in cancer treatment would go out the window. So this is where we're running into an, into an interesting problem. Now, I'm no medical doctor, but picking a person up, let's say, for instance, pick the most industrialized city you know of, pick that person up and clear their system out completely, cure them of all the illnesses and all the toxins that their body has gone through. Now they're perfectly healthy, they're in great shape, they're balanced, their body will work perfectly. Now we're going to set them back in that cesspool that mankind is building. This is why the ETs don't turn around and just stop the problem, because people have to realize you want your planet to survive. Quit poisoning it. Now here's a brilliant concept, and I've got nothing against the, the major pharmaceutical companies that do this. You watch the news like you watch the, the commercials, pharmaceutical companies turn around and they list off a small thing that this medication does. And then they list off three minutes of side effects. And they tell you it's good for you, go and buy it. Now, this is where the one chap you were talking about when he said people are stupid. I agree with him because the pharmaceutical company is doing exactly what they say. 
they go, here is a medication that can help on this thing, but here's 800 problems it's going to cause. And the people go out and buy it. Okay. Now, I'm not entirely certain, but that to me is stupid. So are the ETs just going to come in and correct mankind's problem? No. Conversely, no, it is not the reptilians or shapeshifters or some other off-world or ancient race that is screwing up the human governments around the world. Mankind is doing that quite happily all on its own. So the off-worlders, what they're doing now is they're approaching other people, people like myself, and saying, okay, look, the governments, well, frankly, they're not giving the information out. The corporations are too greedy and they're hanging on to all the information. So we'll give it to the individuals and let that help. So from that end, that's what the ETs are doing. It's a case of they are trying to step in and say, we're helping you by showing you what's wrong. We're telling you. We're telling thousands of people from across the globe, quit the you know, the absolute stupid fighting and start working together and your planet will heal. Mankind is childish. They are, from a galactic standpoint, two-year-olds. Okay, they want, right now they want everything, but they have devolved to a state of expectation. I want this wonderful palace, but I don't want to have to do jack to get it. Okay, so no, the ETs are not going to protect you from catastrophes that are nature and that are naturally based, especially when mankind has the ability itself to deal with it. You know, something to consider for for your listeners to consider is when you're raising a child, your idea, your hope, at least in most parents' case, is that child will learn to go to the washroom on their own. They will learn to get dressed on their own. They will learn to feed themselves, and they will learn to take care of themselves and their neighborhood. That is the goal of pretty much every parent of any decent quality. Okay, I know of some parents that go outside of that and go, they hope their kid does not grow up bigger than they are because they're absolutely abusive. Okay, and the kids will retaliate. So the ETs are doing the same thing. There's a neat little situation going on off-world right now. And understand, just because the ETs are there with these hyper-advanced hyper craft does not mean they're socially in better shape. There is a war going on in this galaxy. Like, and we are talking in our current solar system that has been raging for decades. Well, quite frankly, it's been raging, raging for thousands of years. They haven't got it straight yet either. But at least the individual races are working together on the whole. So this is not a question of the ETs coming in and solving mankind's problems. It's a case of them coming in and going, this is what you need. Now, it is true. In 1986, um, there was a point where the United States armed all of their nuclear missiles, and were ready to launch at Russia. It is also a, tri a fact that there were UFOs seen over every one of the silos shutting down the nuclear warheads. So, yes, they do step in on occasion when people are stupid enough to get to a point that they can eradicate life on their own planet. Because the planet itself is a massive library. It is a massive wealth of energy. And, of course, humans have managed to tap into something other races haven't figured out. And that is the ability to focus energy that is not generated within their own bodies. So, you know, in a nutshell, are the, UN, are the ETs just going to stop the planet from, tearing, from coming apart? Uh-uh. Not going to happen. If they were going to do that... Frankly, there's only one way they would. And any one of the races that has arrived outside of this planet, outside of this, uh, outside of this planet itself, could do it. They'd simply wipe technology off the map by one simple EMP pulse. 
and electronics and technology as mankind knows would end. That would protect the planet right now. And you notice they haven't done that. Does that make yes, sense? But, yes, and but what, in regards to what can we humans do to do our part, this is where a lot of people run into a problem. Because... Yep. Uh, well, okay, well, that, that that's uh, obviously an understatement there, but what I'm talking about specifically is <laughs> if you, the matrix, this matrix that we live in for all intents and purposes, has been set up so that you cannot become successful and wealthy unless you go along to get along with all the other sheeple. I personally... Um, have been criticized, not just by my, my parents, but also people like, um, I used to go to this event called Socrates Cafe, like on a mission to wake people up to this kind of stuff, and I was one of the youngest people there, and a lot of, some of the older people would be like, dude, you are not going to get anywhere in life if you talk about things like conspiracy theories, ETs, and, and all that stuff, and I told them, dude, I already figured that out. To be honest with you, if I had a choice between going along to get along with all the sheeple and making $200,000 a year or having to resort to a life of wealth, welfare paychecks and selling drugs just so I will be able to wake people up and just make enough money to, 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 to um, get through in this life but still have enough time and ability to, to, to wake people up. I would much rather sell drugs and live off welfare just so I can wake people up because I can't do that if I'm going along to get along with the sheep and make $100,000 a year. Um, I mean, uh, I've told that to my parents straight up too, and ever since I told them that, they basically stopped hassling me about how I'm not going to be successful because at that point they basically ran out of ideas in regards to trying to make me change into um, trying to make me be a sheeple. But um, as someone who deals with, with this, how do you um, suggest people that are going to get hassled by the sheeple? Like you are not going to be successful if you don't worry about your reputation and if you don't go along to get along. What do you think would be the best reply to those people who say you got to be a sheeple to be successful? Well, the first thing I do, and I, I've run into the same thing you have. I mean, let's face it, I'm not, I'm not on welfare, okay? Instead, I work a 40-hour-a-week job, and I have a business, okay? So, you know, quite frankly, and rest assured, I don't live high on the hog. If I did, I'd own my own house. What I tell people is very simple. Number one, yes, you do have to get along with people. You do have to follow the laws of the land in which you are. However, what you've got to remember is when you're following your dream, to your guns, you stick to your belief, there are more and more people that are realizing that the current way is not going to work. Okay. Um, the, the best thing you can do to follow that side of it is number one, we do live in a world, and this one took me forever to figure out, money is necessary. Your bills and what have you are absolutely necessary. The way that, they, that, you, that you deal with it is twofold. One, if you're doing something that you, the, the people that are successful in a, and are truly successful are the ones doing what they enjoy doing. So find something you enjoy doing first of all. Number two, Pick what you feel is a reasonable hourly income. Now, because of the way that society is built in the city I live in, I worked it out where if I'm working 30 hours a week, only 30 hours a week, if I make $15 an hour, I can have a roof over my head, I can have my utilities, I can have some of my toys, and every two or three years I can get a decent holiday. Okay, and, you know, eat a good variety of healthy food. Figure out what it will cost you in your area to generate that, to do that. Now, if you're starting out, like in your case, uh, you know, in the case of running a radio, okay, it costs money. Internet money, internet radio still costs. So what you have to look at is how do you get your message across and still get paid? Well, the trick is, quite frankly, by first of all putting down on paper and this is this is literally the the second step in physical manifestation this is one of those neat little secrets nobody wants you to have it would seem 
Three steps in physical manifestation, and this applies to everything on the planet. Think about what you want. Talk about it. You know, dream about it. Great idea. That brings the energy in a realm that you can use. The second step is give it physical form, meaning write it down in present tense. This, again, applies to everything. Be detailed. Okay, and for those of you that are going, well, what about finding a relationship? Well, the trick is describe on paper or in today's world on computer what you see as the perfect relationship. The only catch is you put nobody's name on it because that interferes with freedom of choice. And you put nobody's birth date on it because that limits your scope too much. But you make certain that you specify that the individual is single, is emotionally available, and it would be an advisable advisable option to select the gender you're interested in. Now, then the third step, of course, is go out and do the legwork. When you take a look at, at, for instance, the nature of reality, the, the whole radio show, the whole station, you came up with a dream. You decided and put it on paper what you desired to do, and now you've done the legwork and you have it. The key is taking a look at it and going, where do you want to go with it? Now, when it comes to any industry, it's the same thing. Now, people talk about, well, you have to get it, become a multimillionaire. Multimillionaires didn't get there because of the fact that they were there was something special about them, except they had a dream, they had a goal, and they didn't let anybody tell them it couldn't happen. Now, you know, one of the one of the biggest arguments I personally ran into, my parents to this day still try and tell me, quit your job, go on welfare, because being a working psychic, try, you know, you're an idealist, quit talking to people about making a better world, just get over it. This is a sucky world, live with it. Well, you know, I'd rather be called an idealist than a sheeple because I'm not the only one out there. And, you know, the reality is when you have a dream, like I said, Alexander Graham Bell took 400 shots to make the the telephone work. For the people that desire to hold on to their dreams of a better world, where people get along, well, here's the first step you do. Doesn't matter what you're doing right now, the very next step you do, if you haven't done this, do it to do it in the morning. Do it during daylight because emotions are more stable. Go knock on your neighbor's door and find out who they are. You want a better world? Get to know the neighbors. If you already know your neighbors, this is great. If you get along, that's even better. If you don't get along, Find out why. Okay, because you'll usually find in most cases the reason they don't get along with you or you don't get along with them is because of a misunderstanding. And that's because the two of you don't know each other. Now, this is not a fail safe. There are problems with the idea. But that's where you start. Because rest assured, if nine out of ten people in the neighborhood like each other, and there's one person that nobody likes, the one person will either change or they will leave. Okay, and for pity's sakes, before you do anything else, look in the mirror and decide what you're content with. Are you happy with the person looking back at you? If not, change that which you don't like. Doesn't matter what you change it to. You know, the the real key is don't make the mistake of assuming that Life cannot change. It can, and it does. Oh, yeah. Well, well said. Well well said. And in regards to changing other people, um, well, it's been said if you see somebody acting not themselves, that is the entity in them. Um, And so, I, I mean, sometimes the word entity is taken literally. Sometimes in that sense, it's taken as some sort of a metaphor. But to to illustrate this whole issue, um, I suppose I might as well give a recent example about 
one unfortunate incident that happened in my life that some of my listeners may be aware of about how um, the weekend of uh, September uh, 27th and 28th, when the, we had that recent lunar eclipse, when I went down to Arizona, I was supposed to participate in a peyote ceremony that I paid like $400 for at this uh, place called Peyote Way in the Wilcox, Arizona area, rented a car from an Alamo dealership near the Phoenix airport while I was traveling down in my car to the area on uh, one of the highways. Uh, I got pulled over by the police, and he said I was going over the speed limit. Now, I was well aware that transportation laws, such as speed limits and such, only apply to those who are using the roads for commercial purposes, as do laws pertaining to driver's licenses and um, car insurance and such. So when the cop uh, pulled me over, I flat out told him I am not operating in a for hire capacity by engaging in any form of transportation or other commercial use of the highways. Please acknowledge that you've been so informed. The officer had absolutely no idea what I was talking about, and I realized there was going to be uh, might be trouble there because you know ignorant cops they could could be quite hazardous to society when they're ignorant of the law that they are supposed to uh, uphold and keep the peace and such. Well, I kept telling him that he started threatening me uh, to arrest me and such, and I told him I do not feel safe because your attitude, demeanor, and such. Please cease and desist. You got a deadly weapon on you and such. Um, I do not consent to your actions. Before I knew it, the cop grabbed me out of the car, uh, pushed me to the side of the car, handcuffed me, kidnapped me, uh, took the car, uh, towed it. That's armed robbery, by the way. I spent 30 hours in an Arizona jail, and the only reason I was able to get out in time to catch my plane back to Pennsylvania was because my dear sweet mama was willing to bail me out with her credit card. And even though I didn't show up for the arraignment hearing in Arizona, there should not be a warrant for my arrest right now, because after conducting rule of law, consulting with Rule of Law Radio show co-host Randy Kelton, he told me some three documents that I could um, file by plagiarizing, so to speak, a habeas document by turning it into a motion to dismiss removal of case and a federal lawsuit uh, thing. And um, while I did actually look on the Arizona docket sheets, and this is good news for all my listeners who don't want to see me miss, I typed my name into the Arizona docket sheets thing, and my name did not pop up there. So maybe they did, after all, uh, drop the case after I filed all these papers, and hopefully that is the case. But the thing um, I want to stress here is after the officer had taken me to the uh, to the jail um, I could tell by the look in his eyes that it, it seemed to me he had started to feel a sense of, oh, my God, what have I done? I owe this guy an apology because he realized I cl he clearly did not do, the, do, do what he was supposed to do and totally abused his authority, kidnapping, armed robbery and all the rest of it. But the reason he didn't apologize to me and such was because he didn't want to embarrass himself in front of his coworkers and the rest of the prisoners. And one clue that I he had actually had a tone, change of heart was when he took my phone, he said, we got to take the battery out of this phone. It's just the way they do things in this jail. Uh, he gave me the phone and he said, why don't you take it out? I don't want your property to get damaged. And I didn't know if I should be crying, have steam blowing out of my ears or whatnot at that moment because the way he grabbed me out of the car and shoved me against the car when he handcuffed me and like rummaged through my car and everything after I was in the back of the cop car sir searching everything without a warrant. I'm thinking, you got a lot of nerve to say you don't want my property damaged. Well, by the look in his eyes, I was thinking maybe I had eliminated the entity out of him. And astrologically speaking, I noticed the lunar eclipse that night. And after doing an astrological reading, I can look back on that and say, well, it kind of makes sense that this happened to me on that day. But the whole issue of getting the entity out of the officer and eliminating the entity out of people who have an entity in them, could you perhaps um, tell Tell us about the truth value of uh, people having entities in them when they are acting not themselves and how we as people can help get the entity out of them. In, in more cases than not, when I talk about more, there are very few situations where you're actually dealing with an entity. What you're dealing with is a person's misperceptions, their embarrassment, as you've pointed out, their unwillingness to accept responsibility because they've been told so often they don't have to take responsibility for their actions. And this has started when you're going to kindergarten, and I could go into detail there, but the reality is the way of getting people to look, okay, is to be, and it, it gets to be complicated when you're dealing with the police. The inherent idea is if it's a police officer, they're supposed to know how to deal with people and how to respect them. The problem is that so many people disrespect the police that it has become a two-way uh, two sword. That 
people don't respect the police and the police don't respect people. And that's where you get the occasional person. And unfortunately, there's way too many of them to, to account um, where you're dealing with abuse of power. That is not a new entity. That is a product of what civilization has produced by saying you don't have to take responsibility for your actions. We can go right into school time, right? The, we're talking elementary all the way through, all the way through senior high. I don't know about in the States, but up here in Canada, especially where I live, they won't fail people, which means no matter whether you do your work or not, you're getting rewarded with being, with, with graduating. If there is no punishment, if, there is, if it is not more uncomfortable or more complicated to live because you, because you disrespect senior people, because you don't follow through with your own word, then frankly, there is going to be a problem with getting people to take responsibility as adults. Okay, if you think of your own neighborhood... More parents than not bring their kids, more and more people, not more than not, but more and more parents are taking the elementary kids to school late when it's the parent's responsibility to get the kid to school. Well, by the time it's the kid's responsibility to get to school on their own, they're inherently late. You know, they're, they're always late because they haven't been forward, they haven't been guided to do it. So when we talk about removing the entity, the first thing you do is where it comes to the police, you've got a, a, bit of a, a bit of a problem where you're kind of talking about police when you're talking about people in official capacity. You definitely have a problem, and there's a, a, another way to deal with that. But when you're dealing with the individuals, with just your neighbor, do not accept the responsibility, do not accept the blame for their actions. Now, communication is invariably a 50-50 problem. Physical action is the individual doing the act. Now, this neat little idea, like some people say, oh, it was a demon that made me drink so much. No, frankly, it wasn't. You're the one that picked up, your, picked up the glass and turned it upside down in your face. People have to be told, take responsibility for your own actions. When you're dealing with somebody that you know is completely off kilter, like, and you know the person and they're just doing something completely weird. And this only applies if you actually know the person before they start acting weird. Get them to sit down and focus. And literally, one of the easiest tricks in the book to get somebody to focus is to hold your finger up in front of them. Don't touch them, but hold your one finger up. And I do mean the index finger, not the middle one. And tell them to focus. Ask them to focus on that finger and get them to slow down so they can think. That will help get them back on track. Okay. You know, the, the reality is there are very few cases where it is actually an, a, another spirit, as in a ghost or an entity or whatever you want to call it, or mind control. Very few actual cases of that are, are, are actually real. Okay. You know, that's, that's the, the reality behind that. Okay. Um, you know, some, one of the reasons that when you look at the church, exorcisms work, it's not so much that they're removing an entity in most cases, although that has on occasion happened. It's because so many people believe, and the person being healed believe that that is going to help put their mind back to right, that the added energy, the added focus on them, their head back on straight. You follow? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that does make sense because if you believe you are uh, got an entity in you, then you will act like it sometimes almost involuntarily, no question. But switching gears, just so you know, we've only got uh, 15 minutes and 55 seconds left on the live feed. If you have to finish a thought or something after 8 p.m., we can go past. It's just the listeners will have to call in to listen because the live feed goes off then at 8 o'clock. So let, but let's try to keep this to well, two hours. And We, um, we sort of have to. You know, we sort okay. of have to because I've got another show right after I get off this one. No problem. So uh, one thing we didn't talk about, um, it, it's on your site here. 
it says, have you experienced missing time or woken up with the wrong clothing, not in your bed, marks or bruises? Um, I think we I don't think we actually covered this. We covered UFOs, aliens and ancient races to a great extent, but not this missing time and waking up with things that you that weren't there before. So why don't you uh, I guess maybe even take the last um, 14 minutes or so talking about this very subject, because I think it's highly significant. Well, when we're talking about missing time, and it's, it happens quite more, more frequently than people believe, um, first and foremost, understand when somebody talks about losing time, do not just automatically say, oh, you just forgot what was going on. Okay, that does happen on occasion, but missing time is something that occurs in most cases because of an off-world abduction. Okay, because time is a mutable substance. It is something that can be slowed down. You cannot go back in time. But when people lose track of time, what ends up happening is more often than not, they've been taken. They're knocked out completely. Um, More often than not, it's a case of one of the off-world races collecting them up, usually taking some sort of a blood sample or a fluid sample, there are reported, you know, hundreds of thousands of reports over the decades, over the centuries, really, of people having marks, having gashes that they went to bed and there was no damage. They wake up and something's different. Or they wake up and where the heck did I get this outfit from? These are tied to the off world, to the abduction phenomenon. And what it is, is most people. They try and chalk it up to, oh, I forgot what I was doing. I just zoned out until the dreams start. And more often than not, the dreams get to be somewhat complicated because people don't like being out of control. So the what I deal with is I get a lot of people that contact me going, look, here's a scenario. I remember this. You know, I remember an image I was, you know, I was sitting there in my car, and the next thing I knew, you know, the sun was coming up. Well, it was midnight when I was, when I pulled over, and they're looking at it, going, "What happened?" More often than not, what has happened is that the person has been taken. That's why they lose the time. They just completely lose track of it now. Even amongst the UFO enthusiasts, I have heard people do it where somebody will say, oh, I had this experience and I, I went missing for, 30, you know, for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes. And even in the UFO groups, they'll sit there and tell you, I don't believe you. Well, rest assured, having had it happen more often than I care to count, having talked to people, there is a, a neat gentleman by the name of Tom Reed out of, um, out of Massachusetts that was taken and suffered from missing time back in 1969. Now, the local historical society, the government of Massachusetts, the, um, United, the government of the U.S. and the U.N., all got together and went a real event. It really happened, and they built a monument for it. Okay. Now, the sad part of it is that when we're dealing with missing time, what happens is people get taken. It does happen, and in most cases, they get returned. But off-worlders are not infallible, and sometimes if they've taken three or four people from different cities or from different communities – They take the clothes off so that they can examine them while they're unconscious, not doing anything abnormal, well, not doing anything that scientists don't do to to water buffalo and to cheetahs and to gorillas on another continent. And then they try and remember which clothes go on who. So they try and put them back on. Well, sometimes mistakes happen. Okay. And all of a sudden it's like, well, what do you do with it? Well, what you do with it is you have to try and figure out how to cope with it. People are afraid to go to psychiatrists because, well, the psychiatrist is going to say, well, you're nuts. And that creates its own problem. Okay. Then you have the added bonus of people turning around 
and going, how do I deal with it? Okay, what am I supposed to do? Because it's one of these things that mankind is not taught how to deal with. You're taught there's angels, you're taught there's demons, but in the spiritual teachings, people are not taught that there are other races. So what happens is people go into a panic side. You know, that's the, that is the, the long and the short of it. So it really turns around and, and has a, an interesting situation where people are trying to cope with these phenomenon that they don't understand or, you know, and things like remembering buildings that they don't have a clue what they are. It's because they end up going places that they would never be able to go without the off worlders help. Okay. Um, And the, these are just the tip of the iceberg. You know, one of the one of the hardest things to realize is that just because people know what you have experienced odd things does not mean that they can explain them and quite often the explanation will come out very very strange okay because humans don't have the cognitive capacity because they don't have the experience on the whole, to explain jumping between locations. It's not jumping between dimensions. It's jumping between locations. What most people would call teleportation or matter relocation. Basically, the old idea of the Star Trek phenomenon, you know, where the, where the transporter makes this funny noise and they walk out, you know, the people all of a sudden appear. At the experiencers speak, conference this landed just a few months back over in Portland, Maine, I literally watched that happen with, with a couple of people. And the missing time aspect is one of the fundamental things that tells you that it is probable, and at the very least possible, that you happen to have already had an off-world encounter and just don't recall it. Okay. As for the clothing, hopefully if you come back with clothing that wasn't yours, it's a better client, you know, it's a higher class. Because there is no limit. Like, there is no separation from the the off-worlder standpoint. They don't care whether you're rich or poor. They go after the people they go after for their own reasons. But like I said, this is not something to fear. Granted, it's annoying. But on the whole... The off-worlders are not trying to cause a major problem. Okay. D- does that make sense? Oh, yeah. That's very reassuring, though, for uh, for a lot of people that have a feeling that they're being abducted and such for uh, well for bad reasons. Although I say abducted, but when you think about it, there is no such thing as a true abduction because you did contract to it before uh before you uh your soul incarnated as a human in this reality but um okay we got uh 6 minutes and 55 seconds left on the uh on the live feed uh you did briefly mention um like psychologists and psychiatrists at the uh and uh, earlier in the show, but you kind of mentioned it in passing, like how they'll even look at you like lunatics if you mention things. Now, th- this is kind of something that's very close to me at the moment because my mother, um, she uh, wanted to talk about seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and she actually um, seems to be shifting blame to me about it because, well, she's actually an ophthalmologist and I'm a sun gazer, and you know that ophthalmologists have been trained to believe that looking at the sun is very unhealthy for you even though I know that it's actually not. So that, coupled with the fact that she's taking care of my grandparents who have um, somewhat mild uh, to moderate dementia, has kind of stressed her out, and uh, she wanted to go to a psychiatrist. Um, well, I don't know if it was a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, psychiatrists can prescribe medicine. Psychologists can't. Uh, but um, And she wanted me to go with her, and I'm st- flat out telling her, um, okay, if you want to go, fine, but just try to keep it to one appointment because the only thing psychologists and psychiatrists are good for is brainwashing you. You're kind of making a big mistake, and don't blame me for uh, making yourself stressed out. You're making yourself stressed out. Well, I mean, that's one of the most debatable things in, in life, whether or not you're stressing yourself out or other people are responsible for stressing you out or if it's a combination 
combination of both. But but anyway, I'm digressing. So for all those people out there who think that they're going to get a little help from seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist, could you, uh, in the last um, four and a half minutes or so that we have, uh, let them know that it's not in your best interest to, to do something like that? Uh, no, I absolutely won't let them know that. And here's okay. why. All right. Uh, okay. Um, number one, psychologists and psychiatrists do have a definitive purpose and a very viable need. Like, like a very viable, they are a viable resource. It is hard to find one that is good. Absolutely. But let us understand something very critical. Some people that have complications with their life have them because of the fact that they don't, because of the fact there is a legitimate chemical imbalance that they're dealing with. Now, a normal person is not going to deal with that. You need somebody that's got some sort of training. A psychologist is somebody that has studied a lot of people. Now, in my case, I spent from age 10 to present talking to people and getting to know how they think on a wide variety, but most people don't have that opportunity. So I'm what you would call, aside from the fact I'm also a psychic, I'm what you would call a self-taught psychologist. I understand the way people think. If you don't have a way of wrapping your brain around something, then frankly, talking to somebody that at least has some training is better than trying to figure it out on your own. Okay, now for pity's sakes, I will say this about psychiatry. When a psychiatrist prescribes you a medication, it is always wise to do two things. One, get a second opinion to make sure that a medication is actually required. And for pity's sakes, check the side effects of any medication you're looking at. Usually a pharmacist will tell you that better than a psychiatrist will. Okay, but this idea of don't go, well, frankly, I know a lot of people that if they hadn't gone, instead of being a little quirky, would have been mass murderers. And I'm, that's not downplaying it. That is the reality. So understand psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors, police, politicians, they're all necessary, but they do need to be educated a little better on the ramifications and the side effects of doing things like prescribing a pill to cure a simple problem. Prime example, many people that have mood swings, okay, you prescribe a pill to, to, to counterbalance them. The reality is most of them are a nutrition problem. Many people suffering from acne that, go, that subsequently have low self-esteem, well, what they find out, going to a psychologist, they'll find they've got low self-esteem and that's affecting things. But the reality behind most cases of acne is, frankly, too much sugar. So you cut the sugar, the acne goes away, self-esteem climbs. It's kind of an odd side effect. But for the people, and this is why it is imperative people realize that Psychiatry and psychology are very necessary because if it weren't for people in those professions, frankly, half the people that are functioning today would not be able to function. Can you picture how well an autistic child, somebody whose mind doesn't work quite normally, would be able to function in society at all if somebody hadn't taken the time to figure him out? Well, uh, I guess okay. that does but don't make I, that does actually Pardon? make perfect sense if you if you think about. It. Sorry, the the Blog Talk Radio voice was saying ninety seconds left. I was interrupted there, but uh, yes, that yeah. does make sense to a great degree. And I guess I should apologize to all the psychologists and psychiatrists there for making it seem like you're bad. And kudos to you, um, Mr. Uh, Keith Andrews, for saying no. I will not do that because they're necessary. But uh, uh, we have come to the end of this show, though, so I can't say anything further about that. And I will end this show by telling you the same thing I tell all of my guests. You are indeed a fascinating individual, and I have no doubt that if I wanted to, I could do another show with you, but one of my goals with this Nature of Reality radio show is to get as many different people on my show as possible before I give any one specific guest double dips, because I feel that that is the fairest, most impartial, and most informative way 
of doing a radio show that seeks to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. That does mean, I regret to say, Mr. Andrews, I probably will not be asking you to come on my show again, but that's only because I need to give thousands of other fascinating individuals the chance to have some glory on my show. But it was a pleasure having you on, and I'm glad. You mentioned Ed Baker. He was the one that recommended you, so kudos to him, too. He was a great guest. It's a shame the show I did with him hasn't gotten too many views because he seems like a good presidential candidate. And I promise you I will upload the video to you so a lot more people can listen to it and get the self-help that they need and good luck on all your future endeavors and maybe I'll see you at a UFO conference or something in the future absolutely thanks for having me I've enjoyed it alright take care now later you you too take care well folks that's the end of this show next week I will be having Reverend John Polk on my show he was also recommended by Ed Baker and he I recently got his book in the mail talking about how Yahweh the God uh is actually, or was, or well, is or was, depending on your point of view, uh, an extraterrestrial. And as soon as I finish reading Mark Kimmel's book, Angels, ETs, and Us, the book called Chrysalis, I, I will uh, start reading Reverend John Polk's book about Yahweh being an extraterrestrial. So Reverend John Polk, next Wednesday, 1021. But as the end of this show, this is Andrew Fisher signing off from Nature of Reality Radio. Enjoy the rest of your Trek Thought Infinite Consciousness, everybody.